The Hedgeless Horseman here. It's July uh, 12th, 2022. Uh, I think we set a new all time high or at least a two year high in belly aching and whining on Twitter today. Uh, it's, I mean, kind of almost funny. Uh, it's like people investing in something and all they do is, uh, you know, not everyone, but a lot of people just complain. Uh, about the, the state of the miners, etc., that everything is so horrible, uh, etc. I mean, if, if it should be pretty obvious that okay, if if all you do is whine about the current circumstances, that means you don't even see the opportunity in the current circumstances. So my question to these people is like, why are you? even investing why are you even trying to stock pick why are you even in this sector if you have no idea where we are because that implies that you have no idea why you should make any money if you have an idea like you know a simple one for example like well i'm i'm gonna do the old-fashioned way i'm simply gonna buy low which everyone says is the correct correct thing and then sell high Okay, so in that case, you can probably see, again, this is just a proxy I use, Bear Creek Mining. Uh, you can probably see that we're pretty low right now. We're pretty low. This was the bottom tick. And now, of course, everybody's scared. And most people are selling or thinking of selling because uh, like the... You know, always is the case. People, people at bottoms, they're not afraid that they bought something that should go down. They're afraid that somebody will go and sell their share, so they will go down. No real, you know, thought in terms of, you know, what am I actually, how, how much stuff, how many ounces do I get? What's the company fundamentals going to be over the next one, two years? How does that compare to what price I'm paying today? That's just an afterthought. Uh, people at these bottoms, uh, they're of course selling because they think that, uh, you know, anything can go, go lower. That's basically what they fear. So, I mean, if we as this, look at Bear Creek Mine, I have no idea. This company might go bankrupt, whatever, but, you know, strategic metals is around the same level. Uh, so, yeah, basically, this is the global financial crisis. This was the, I think, greatest bear market in miners ever, or at least in, last, in the last, like, two, three decades. Um, so, you know, from a risk-reward standpoint, uh, what's theoretically, or let's say, Bear Creek Mining does not get go bankrupt. Uh, so we're afraid of, uh, you know, this... 15% from here would take Bear Creek uh, to the global financial crisis bottom. 25% uh, would be, uh, after that, it's the lowest ever. And a lot of stuff has happened for Bear Creek mining. They've added some assets, I think, like the Mercedes, Mercedes mine. So uh, I, I wouldn't say it's probably not going to have the same market cap as back here simply because I, you know, they raised money, etc. But they've all also added assets. So it's like, I mean, this is as close as we get, I think. So basically, you know, from a theoretical standpoint, uh, this is what people are afraid of. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I think this is the stuff you should be looking at. I mean, right off the bat, it's pretty obvious. It's like, uh, okay, if we assume, just assume here, theoretical standpoint, that if you, if you buy here, I'm not saying buy Bear Creek Mining, but this is just an example. If if, if you buy here, uh, you'll, let's say, get a 400% return. And typically, let's say, you know, on average, that's going to happen within two years. Okay, so that, that's what you get if you, let's say, bought here, went away, didn't look at your portfolio for two years. You only have a sell order uh, up at 36 uh, that's that would be a pretty good return 400 percent in two years uh that's uh, you know insane returns obviously uh, but that's apparently not enough uh, because everybody wants to bottom pick because there's a chance that it might actually go lower uh 
to me again like i've said before to me this is just pure greed basically saying i'm not happy with a 400 percent return i want a 600 percent return uh, and disregarding the fact that uh, they are probably not even had good long-term returns so it's again it's 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 certainly not this last you know week uh, that's uh, what what kills people but that's how they always think for some reason i mean i see a bunch of people and uh, close to throwing in the towel or are set to sell at any uptick and the, typically people that bought in here it's like yeah you can't help everyone uh, this should be pretty common sense i think i mean if again if you had no experience with this sector you just saw the juniors right now and if we consider this to be a valid uh, sentiment indicator or proxy for juniors it would be like you would almost have to be brain dead not to spot uh, the places where you should be loading the boat uh, but instead when people actually get in late which most do and experience this uh, their judgment and objectivity gets goes right out the window so now they just want the pain to stop and every day i mean every additional day we see belly aching it's like you know constantly uh, so i mean you can understand that people get miserable because they look at the daily swings the daily movements all the time it's like just waiting for uh, them to be rich tomorrow i mean if you don't have any patience you're pretty effed anyway uh moving on interesting slide here uh silver graph uh, a silver graph for the cot speculators and commercials which uh, uh, uh commercials are almost completely neutral this is a contrarian indicator i mean pretty good this goes back to okay early 2021 so from a contrarian standpoint, this is, uh, you know, if one only used this, this would be the best, I guess, you know, time to be buying silver. Uh, it's if you're a contrarian, because most people have sold out and the trend has been down for so such a long time that uh, all the momentum traders are, you know, positioned one way and the smart money is positioned the other, pretty much to sum up. Uh, and also on the last video I get a, got a question uh, because I used GDXJ to show uh, a theoretical example that if I had owned the GDXJ I bought at the exact top in 2011 then rode that down to minus 90% over the next uh, several years that uh, if, if from the bottom uh, I started investing around the bottom, but if we just assume that the bottom of my portfolio in 2016, early 2016, was after a 90% drop, uh, I would still be in the green. Just to again show an example that uh, it's like uh, being down 50, 60% is certainly not a uh, catastrophe, especially at times like this. I mean, a, a, a lot of stuff is down even the best stuff is down like 30 40 percent so I, I again i don't know where people get this idea from that the most volatile one of the most volatile sectors on earth if you're seeing at a 50 percent paper loss that's some kind of big disaster no you should actually expect to sit uh, in on a 50 percent paper loss i mean i've had multiple occasions of that uh but uh just to touch on uh, why use JDXJ? Well, that was the best example, and it's like, okay, that's the index that uh, is actually closest, to some, one of the ones that's closest to the actual juniors, and it's been around for, uh, yeah, since then. Uh, I am, however, not invested in JDXJ. I am not invested in GDX. I'm not invested in invested in any index uh, fund, especially not in mining, because uh, I. I categorize uh, th three let's say I, I categorize mining stocks and that include juniors in in three categories you have the trading sardines optionality place uh, that's basically the bear creek minings uh, mature juniors you know developers can't really do much in terms of growth they have a grilled out project uh, they dilute now and then and tinker on the project etc so you have these wild durations especially bear creek mining i mean uh, when sentiment is insanely hot uh, it can run like hell but when it is insanely cold it 
crashes all the way down to a level we're seeing now. Uh, that's not my cup of tea. In, in that case, I mean, if I was in the optionality place primarily, I, I would be, you know, loading the boat right now. I would be loading the boat here, there, here, here. So is this a time for optionality place? Yes, I, I think so. If you like optionality place, it's, uh, you know, it, it can't get much worse, pretty much. You can't buy much worse. And we know that uh, uh, the big money is in the delta from uh, atrociously bad sentiment to high sentiment or atrociously bad sentiment to uh, incredibly high sentiment. Then you can have, you know, 1,000, 2,000 percent runs in some of these optionality plays uh, again it's not my cup of tea because I don't like trading uh, I'm fully invested all the time and I don't like the idea of just like a ping pong ball uh, going up and down or and, and slightly down perhaps you if you account for dilution but if if uh, you like or have thought about optionality plays uh, I think now would be uh, one of the best times in the last like 15 years uh, to actually get in because there's a I mean honestly it's like I think I can make money if I was only an option healthy place from here but I simply prefer to stick to high growth stories uh, mature producers let's say GDX etc GDXJ perhaps as well reason I don't like them is that is because I mean mining is a very hard and terrible business and like we're seeing now I mean inflation typically catches up with uh, the gold price uh, for whatever reason uh, and I mean I, I guess that's also what tends to happen when when companies all of a sudden get uh, flush with money like the producers maybe you you know spend a few extra bucks you buy new vehicles you I don't know, take extra trips, whatever, whatever, you know, salaries increase, etc. And you have the the uh, labor unions, perhaps like give me, give us more money, give us more money. You're making so much money. Uh, and it doesn't help when they basically at the top, uh, last top, they were everything was as far as I can tell, everything was growth focused. So. The major miners were pressured to make costly acquisitions. Redback Mining was bought for $9.2 billion, for example. I mean, the whole whole Kinross company today is valued at $5.2 billion. So you can you can guess how much uh, you know value has been destroyed. And, and there's been a few, I think, the billionaire Paul Jackson or whatever his name was. Uh, he basically did a piece where he went through how much capital has, ha, capital has been destroyed in the mining business. So I don't like that mature miners because I I still have, you know, pretty much all the risks uh, unless you're a very diversified company like Newmont, which has operations all over the place and some, some lobbying power, I guess. Uh, otherwise, it's like a mature producer. What else? Uh, I mean, take a mine, for example, if you have a 10 year a mine with a 10 year mine life just assuming that they don't really find any new discoveries around it that the value of that mine peaks on the first day of production because there's only that mine is only a business for the next 10 years and it will shrink in value as it you know depletes the ore reserves so it's like every time a new mine gets put into production, a fuse is lit and then they will have to, you know, find more ounces or find more mines, etc. to not only not only compensate for all the production, the, all the gold they're taking out every day and every year, they actually need to find more and put even more in production in order to grow. So I see mature mining companies as capital destroyers where you take uh, a lot of risks. Uh, they typically do stupid stuff like overvalued acquisitions at the top. And for some reason, I haven't seen too many acquisitions now. Well, we, we see mergers and stuff. I think Goldfields is trying to take over Yamana. And we saw, uh, you know, Kirkland Lake got sold by Agnico Eagle, uh, etc. Uh, but from what I hear, uh, focus is now on short-term profitability because they made such a mess here and were and got so much flack for not being profitable and actually destroying so much capital. So now the focus has been on profitability. 
but the cost has been that uh, growth and the long term health of the company has instead been put on the back burner. So they don't, the major miners don't really have a good growth pipeline or any pipeline at all, I guess, to even keep up the production. And you might remember the slide Kresger showed, I think, last video or two videos ago, where they showed the decrease in production for majority of the large gold miners. So basically their business is shrinking right now in terms of gold production. And I'm assuming growth prospects as well, but uh, they are, you know, throwing off cash. So they're they're getting cashed up, let's say. I, I think the major miners have a record, you know, cash balance and uh, not so much debt. So they have a lot of firepower in terms of capital, but they're not using any. And that's, of course, what I like about the juniors, because for every year that passes, the senior producers will need to put more stuff into production and find more in order to you know, just not shrink away because in 20 years maybe most of the uh, many of the large mines gold mines today uh, might be depleted totally depleted so it's like I mean a barrack or whatever I mean they, they basically need to put another barrack in production in the next 20 years so I think this might change soon uh, when they, you know, get have a panic like, hey, yes, we're throwing off cash here and shareholders are kind of happy, but I mean, we're nearing the, we don't even know if we're, we're going to have a business in 10 years or it's at least going to shrink. So in short, I don't like mature miners because I get a lot of risk and you don't have, especially now, you don't seem, they don't seem to have any plans to grow. Uh, so that's not a, something I like. I, I'd rather just buy a perpetual business or almost a perpetual business like Coca-Cola or whatever if I wanted to have uh, infinite dividends instead of buying some large gold miner that, you know, uh, for a period of time can have, you know, solid dividends and especially if gold goes up. But they don't have, even have a business if they don't find new mines. I mean, Coca-Cola is not going to run out of sugar, I think, for example. Uh, then we have my cup of tea, high growth stories, because there's always risk in everything, but I want to be compensated for the risks I'm taking, and I want to, to be compensated as much as possible to the upside. Uh, kind of like, you know, what we're seeing now in terms of market timing. I mean, the, the, the downside risk in juniors here, I mean, they're already undervalued, so they shouldn't be down here anyway. But in, in, in like, even absolute terms, from sentiment alone, I mean, there, there's not, it's not too much room left for many of these companies to go down because some are, you know, they're trading like they're worthless and some have, excuse me, really solid projects. Uh, so this level won't last forever, or forever, and certainly if juniors go even further down, that that will certainly not last forever. So any downside from here, we, assuming they at least have, you know they can survive that's limited in time and scope and the upside is this so again you compare with like i don't know 25 30 percent downside may, maybe in a flash crash some could go down 50 percent but you compare it to the upside basically that when it turns and it will uh, you're looking at you know 400 450 percent returns depending on uh, the company and the time horizon uh, so that's a good risk reward in my book. Uh, Barrick Gold or whatever does not have a minuscule downside because that, that's a producing miner and they were near bankruptcy in 2015-16. But you don't have that explosive upside potential because Barrick cannot grow 200% in value without the help of gold, serious help uh, by the price of gold in the next two years. But there's a bunch of miners that could add on 200% in value um yeah uh, this is uh, I, I had a debate with someone today who basically said that if if you're down minus 50 percent you were too early and therefore you were wrong and i just sent this bear creek mining uh short again i don't like bear creek mining but basically what he's saying that uh, this was a mistake by default because it went down 50 percent buying here was a, a mistake because it went down 50% uh, before going up almost 300 
buying here or here, uh, well, yeah, buying here was a mistake, uh, even though you would be up 187%. So basically, again, this is all bullshit. Uh, and to me, it looks a lot like on Twitter, uh, which fascinates me. It's like, not to be sound too harsh, but it's like the blind leading the blind. People who don't really have any track, rec track record of beating the junior mining business especially or making money in the junior sector basically giving advice to everyone else and everyone else agreeing with them i mean i find it kind of weird it's like if if you don't even have good results or a good track record or not even the uh, experience or history if you bought in here you don't you don't have much, you haven't even seen a full cycle you've only been a part for the downtrend uh, i mean there's a reason why most funds and that goes for you know high quality funds active funds they say you know you typically they say you should not be invested in or invest in our fund if you're not willing to sit uh, sit on your hands for 5 years because that's basically what how much time they think it takes for you know the the results to reflect their you know superior investing skills so basically they're saying that anything can happen really within five years uh, but if you give them five years or more uh, they should be up um, and, I, and that's makes makes total sense it's like that, that's why i keep saying you should not uh, you should not look judge your results if, if from from this period i mean if if you should judge results especially in a very sentiment driven sector you should judge it based on what your portfolio is worth now versus here or here or here you should not use this as you know uh, uh, evidence that you you are a shitty investor and can't beat the market because almost nobody uh, is you know uh, even up uh, from this period but I think people trick themselves and believe that they're worse than they are. And typically why people buy a, uh, buy up here is typically because they think they're very good at what they do. And then they see some up movement and they th feel even better about it. And now they want to sell. So they want, wanted to buy here and they felt good about it. Now they want to sell because they feel bad about it. Um, this is another interesting <laughs> short, I think. I remember someone had mentioned Rick Rule saying that he suffered, I don't know how many, like six or eight 50% corrections in Pan American Silver before he had a, you know, a 40 bag or something like that. So I just went back and looked. Uh, I mean, uh, Pan American today is quite, uh, you know, a mature producer. I think it has a market cap of 5 billion. Uh, but back here, obviously, I mean, this was, uh, you know, starting off in 94. That's ancient history. So I'm assuming this was a growth story back here. Uh, and, uh, I mean, we can make some conclusions in hindsight here. Uh, obviously, they kept on growing. And uh, for I don't know, from this point on, actually, gold and silver price uh, helped. Anyway, so from if you bought in here this early in a you know growth story with uh, let's say good management etc. If you just bought here and sat through uh, what is it like ninety four six uh, okay yeah so fourteen years you would get a four thousand two hundred sixty two percent return. So that's uh, you know uh, almost a forty three bagger. That's a pretty good return. I think I calculated the annual growth rate of 30%. So that's like really, really, really good. Uh, but you can see how hard it would be for a lot of people, especially the ones that, you know, think uh, sitting through a 50% loss is too much. I mean, <laughs> here you have like, you know, 37% corrections, 51, for, uh, 40, uh, almost 41, 61. And that's one within a very large one that actually went down almost 80 percent and this leg was minus 65 i mean you, you can see just how many heavy retracements heavy correction you would have to sit through to actually get a 41 bagger and most people can't sit through one 
And another inter uh, or another point I would make is like, okay, you have a growth story here. Uh, the trend is ob has obviously been up, even though this was a very heavy correction. This was when uh, gold and silver, I think, got pretty crushed. Anyway, uh, in hindsight, if we assume that the story was intact, it's, it becomes pretty obvious that you should have bought every dip. Every single dip. I mean, if you bought this 9 to uh, 92, that's like, you know, what is that? 300% in 2003, yeah, five years. I mean, that doesn't sound ex uh, extremely good, perhaps, but it is actually very good returns. Uh, so I, I think this short highlights my investing strategy. Uh, I tend to bet big on probable growth. When I see a story, a growth story that is intact, I just buy. I, I just buy uh, every dip. As the more price diverges from value, I just buy and buy and buy. And who knows? Maybe the actual growth trajectory was something like this, so it was maybe overvalued at some points and and uh, severely undervalued at other points. But it's like, don't kid yourself. This is one of the most volatile sectors there are, and I can assure you that I don't think fundamentals uh, oscillated this much <laughs> uh, and another one it's like now the, all the rave lately I mean like I said in a previous video everybody tries to find all the excuses they can in order to do what feels best for them meaning selling low because they're afraid scared and want to justify selling low and the latest rave has been about the US dollar because the US dollar has been ramping. It's been weighing on gold, not as much as one would have thought, but that's basically what I'm seeing on Twitter right now. The US dollar is going to kill us all. Uh, no point being in miners, uh, no point being in gold or whatever. Uh, so I just went back and looked. Uh, this was the last time the US, uh, the DIX index, the uh, USD index, uh, was at this uh, uh, level. And uh, actually continue to ramp higher. So if you look, what happened to gold during that time? Uh, so if we're here now, let's just pretend that we're going up to, I think this was 122 and now we're at like 107, 108. So let's say it goes up to this. This is what happened with gold. Uh, gold went down eight, uh, a bit over 8% when uh, the US dollar kept on ramping. And when the US dollar topped, uh, you know, depending on if you call this or this a top, gold then, when the dollar topped, went on a 285% uh, rally. This was the global financial crisis and then even higher. So from bottom to top here, I don't know, 600% or something, uh, may, maybe more actually, 800 perhaps. Uh, so again, it's like what I've been saying, I'm not invested in gold or juniors, gold, silver juniors, uh, because of how the present looks. I'm I'm after the big move. And I think the big move could come when the dollar finally tops out, at whatever level it tops up, tops out. So if, with that in mind, it's like if you just held this, you're like, yes, gold, uh, USD is ramping, but I don't give a crap about that because I know it's going to top one day. Um, uh, which, I mean, no rally lasts forever and no uh, no correction lasts forever. Yes, you would have suffered 88% loss, then 285% up. And if you were in juniors, you'd probably, I don't know, like if you were in Pan American, you would be up, well, a lot. Uh, let's just say uh, like that. So I, I th again, I think this is just one one of many of those noises you see out there. Because the, the only thing I'm sh I have no idea what the dollar is going to do or when it's going to top. If it's going to go to 122, if it's going to go up to 140, if it's going to top tomorrow or go up to 200. All I know is that y gold juniors especially and uh, some silver juniors are absolutely dirt cheap. That's That's the only certainty I have. That's my only buy criteria buy when they're extremely undervalued because that won't last forever uh, and funnily enough it's like again if we're here somewhere around here uh, on the way up in the dollar 
you can see this is actually where gold bottom ticked so even though the dollar kept on ramping here and almost hit the same level actually uh, when the dollar was up here but you can say that this was actually the bottom in that case the gold bottom two years before uh, and you know before the dollar topped and the dollar in other words gold bottom and the, it, it, despite the fact that us dollar just kept ramping and if we use uh, if if we use this as a bottom it's still bottom months or even this is early 2002 this would be early 2001 almost a year before at least uh, several months before this top and if this is a higher top or a double top i don't care but gold was actually up already so gold was front running the top in dollar the ultimate top in dollar depending on how you look at it either by two years or at least you know uh, a few months uh, to several months so even in translation even if you think the dollar is gonna go up higher in 2000 around 2000 when that happened gold still bottomed even though the, the US dollar kept on going up so again it's like it's funny I, even if somebody gave you uh, you know a sheet sheet codes like I promise you do, you had a crystal ball the dollar is gonna ramp and you sold your gold you, you would have lost out of course you would probably rather own the dollar but point remains like there's there's no certainty for anything again the only certainty i have is that juniors are extremely cheap um so what i'm what i'm what i am focusing on is picking the best companies the the, the high growth companies so here here you have goliath for example today it's like okay they hit in a new one kilometer step out hole so they've hit in this step out hole they've hit down here they've hit here from previous uh, f from the last season they already know we know they've hit here now they've hit here this footprint of whatever this is is getting huge and i don't know goliath is up 15 percent today maybe it's up what's that in like eight million or something i don't know it's like who cares that's that's like a rounding error i mean that is minuscule to what you know all these hits so far implies about the potential of uh, what goliath has that's like a rounding error if sure zone ends up being a you know a high grade multi-million ounce system this part i don't know economic value you know over 500 million i would guess if if this turns out to be some you know big bulk mineralization or something and this is actually in a lower strata uh, this as well i think than the shorebed zone so i mean who knows what else is there who, who knows what's going to be found under the shorebed zone are they going to find the source of this one for example so so everything is like details uh, compared to the results they're having but of course the market at times like this doesn't really care but how much more can you ask for let's say the implied value of goliath jumped uh, with uh, i don't know 30 40 million today and jumped 30 40 million on this news or whatever and on the last news it barely went up and now it went up like eight million dollars i mean this is the this is the key i mean if you think this sector is so hard i mean tell me how you can be in a better position than to actually you know steal this amount of success and you don't even pay for it i mean that's the that's the blessing of these down markets but still people stick to you know i see a lot of people complaining and then i look at the portfolios like oftentimes like i would never buy that i would never own that i would never own that this is the stuff i like to own because they're you know the roi on their drilling they have 100 percent hit rate so they're like one of the fastest value creators around right now so before this season is over and they just up the drilling program from 25 to 27 thousand meters i guess that's based on the success from from new gold here so if they drill out in six months when they have drilled from all these pads they might have an inferred system of who knows like five million ounces i'm just guessing here 
high grade gold hopefully and perhaps you know bulk mineralization probably still wide open and it it's selling for 60 million today i mean this would be a you know jump to a, like a tier 2 project on the way to maybe i even end up like a tier 1 project that's going to be worth several hundred millions if not billions so it's like do i see this as a problem no it's like i, I bought more goliath today because the market opened up like four plus uh, uh, four percent plus it's like jesus christ i mean thanks for thanks for you know leaving so much money on the table every every day on in this market so then then it's like an example of opportunity trade let's uh, say you have 10 juniors uh one junior uh, you think they're fa e uh, fairly or uh, equally cheap one junior comes out with a news release that ups the you know the value of the news release is like 50 percent of the current low market cap obviously that's an opportunity you could sell like some of the other nine and buy into the one that that uh, suddenly jumped 50 percent higher you know in value 50 percent of the market cap and who knows what the starting value actually would be i mean there's plenty of opportunity plenty of opportunity at, at times like this but most people just throw up their hands and just look the stock didn't move so why would i buy that i mean christ you're supposed to take advantage of the market not use the market as a due, due diligence oh the uh, the stock didn't move on this great news so i guess the news isn't great no everyone is brain dead and scared shitless right now but there's a bunch of juniors that are like creating value hand over fist and you can pick them up at the same price without even taking the risk before the success was known. And and uh, for example, uh, I, mean, I mean, most oh, maybe we should start with take Prosper Gold for example, uh, a junior explorer. I think it's quite cheap right now. Good management, a lot of skin in the game. They did a wildcat drilling campaign on Golden Corridor. They they missed, so the fundamentals went down. Okay, fundamentals went down from from this period to this. Yes, price uh, kind of like Bear Creek Mining went down uh, is down to the flash crash lows of 2020. Okay, so so maybe the actual value of uh, Prosper is I don't know around here or whatever. So you have this kind of gap. So it completely crashed, but fundamentals went down with it to this level. Let's say. I mean, the story is not over. They, I think they have cash and they have a lot of projects, etc. But just bear with me. Okay, so this is the price to value gap here. You shouldn't only look at how much a stock has fallen because I see people pile into absolute crap that is actually quite crap or have had a lot of negative news. And, and the price to value gap hasn't really ex expanded because uh, value went down uh, on par with price let's say so you, so you have this value gap you, you don't have uh, this value gap because fundamentals decrease as well and then you have stories like sk mining i mean every other news release uh, they basically up the blue sky scenario over this period even though the share price has been pretty choppy stagnant neutral whatever i mean maybe the mean selling price is like 2.4 it's down to yeah, around this. So, so it's like for, for the mean price of last year, SK is only down 24% compared to like, you know, Prosper Gold, which is down, I don't know, you know, 70 or something. So what has actually happened? I mean, value has just kept on increasing. So there is a humongous price to value gap. There is a big price to value gap because fundamentals went up, price went slightly down. So you, that's what you typically have, and let's just compare it if we add Bear Creek Mining as a uh, sentiment indicator for the junior sector. Okay, so basically, again, they were having success with headwinds. So this is basically where, let's say, Bear Creek Mining topped. So, so this success was met by a declining sentiment. So what happens with a, like a high quality growth store like this, instead of going down, 
and in the case of many that you know where the fundamentals would have been neutral for example over this period of time maybe price actually went down 50 percent but since they have been increasing in value uh, increasing the store in value uh, it's only you know down 25 percent but the gap is still uh, expanding so maybe th there's a similar gap right now for sk mining then if uh, not, nothing much had ha happened in terms of improved fundamentals and price would have been down here so you would have this gap price would be here value would be here so you would have this gap instead you have maybe you know value up here whatever and you have this gap so basically it's stalled out uh, because the fundamentals improves in such a you know quick pace that actually despite atrociously bad sentiment that was trending down it managed to at least you know hold the price steady uh, so this was expanding because sentiment is getting worse and worse but share price didn't move too much down but uh, this price to value gap increased uh, same thing for Allure I think also one of these I mean let's say this is the mean price maybe it's down 21% from the mean over the last year and a half so basically your portfolio would have been flat over this period in time or, or maybe minus 21%. But a lot of people are screaming like, you know, uh, everybody's getting killed and everything is death. And a lot of stuff is done. But the ones that just keep on delivering like Eloro, uh, uh, you have a very large price to value gap, which is due to sentiment. But if Eloro hadn't really created that much value, let's say the fundam fundamentals would have been uh, flat. Then I think to have, again, to have a price to value gap like this, which you see at sentiment lows, maybe price would have actually gone down here. Or some, maybe that's a bit extreme, but here at least. So that's, so it's not like there isn't a discount in the ones that haven't crashed 70%. It's just as value has increased so much. So you, you kind of get fooled, I think, sometimes by, you know, perhaps wanting to sell the ones that have basically stayed neutral in order to buy the ones that's down 70%. And I do that sometimes, but you have to be aware, in my opinion, of the fact that uh, typically, and especially in the case of Eloro, fundamentals have improved so much that it's probably as cheap as another, you know, relatively high quality junior that's actually down 70%, because that junior might have not created as much value as Eloro but the price to value gap is the same it's just that Eloro is just down 21% versus this other junior that's down 70% but fundamentals have not gone up uh, like this in in the other case so you have this price to value gap and in Eloro you actually have this so both are extremely cheap but Eloro's share price has been neutral uh, but it is still cheap because fundamentals have improved. Same with Goliath. Uh, this is when sentiment started to really go south in the junior sector. And it actually bucked the trend for a while. But then you have this kind of consolidation, sideways consolidation. Uh, so what's the mean price here? Yeah, maybe like... Maybe like, you know, $1.16, it's at 96. I mean, it, it looks like uh, wild movements, but it's actually not that wild. So maybe you're down 17%, you know, on your average purchase over this period. Or maybe you're actually up if you're a, you know, value investor. I remember buying here. Uh, so again, my, uh, you know, I, I don't know what everyone invests in. Uh... But it's like I, I stick, which I've said, to intact growth stories with probable growth. And it, there's no, not many cases that are more probable growth than Goliath or ha have had. But still, the price hasn't even reacted to it yet. Anyway, uh, that has at least allowed this story to be kind of neutral. So th they basically plateaued. So if you held these kinds of stocks, for example, you're... For over the last year, I mean, if this was the bulk of your portfolio, you certainly would be down 70%. And especially if you if you bought, incre you know, like I always advocate for, if you continuously try to buy as low as possible, maybe your average in, you know, SK, maybe, you know, who knows, down here. So you're down 20%. And the lower, I mean, I've been 
uh, I added a bunch throughout all this period. So basically, my my Lord Eloro uh, position uh, uh, from this period is flat. Whereas again, people like you know, I can't make money in this sector. Yada yada yada. It's like uh, yeah, that's because everybody buys high. Like Snowline, Snowline Gold has bucked the trend, and yes, I think they have a probable growth. It's one of my larger holdings, have become one of my larger holdings. Pacific Ridge, same thing. It's like dirt cheap, in my opinion. Nothing has changed. They haven't, um, I think they're already starting out so cheap, but it's like, yeah, okay, since, I don't know, what is it, okay, start of the year, it's basically neutral. But, it, but if you're only in bad companies or companies that uh, uh, you know high risk and they miss on their wildcat yeah you're gonna get absolutely killed but that does not stop you again if you're down a lot in stories like this or whatever the story is not over for prosper gold and stuff like that high quality serious juniors and there's nothing stopping anyone from totally shuffling the whole portfolio at any given time but i see people who complain about this sector being so hard, unforgivable, you can't make money in this. And typically, they buy and they hold stuff that I would never buy or hold. So it's not like... I mean, you, ha you have to do some work yourself. You cannot just like... Yeah, you know, uh, well, at this point, one might actually just be able to buy almost whatever. Uh, and still, uh, not, you know, I wouldn't, inc wouldn't encourage that. But you can't just like, yeah, I'm, I, I think gold uh, juniors are going to go up. So I just buy whatever junior with no real plan. And then like, you know, questioning, it's like, ah, how can you beat this market or whatever? It's like, I'm still holding SK Mining and it's been very good to me. Same with Eluro. It's like, yeah, okay, it's been sideways last year or whatever. And I've had many, you know... Um, I'm sitting on many paper losers as well. You know, uh, uh, Novo being one, obviously White Rock, etc. But you have when you have some of these uh, probable growth stories that just keeps on delivering. I mean, they'll they'll hold up your portfolio. So whereas the average junior has gone like this, Allure has basically you know flatline, and that's outperformance. Same with SK. I mean. Look at let's see what you know Bear Creek Mining has done worse relative to SK. Uh, yeah, it's been absolutely destroyed. I mean, what what kind of fall is this? I'm I'm assuming like 60 percent. SK is down like twenty percent. Uh, so again, it's like you do whatever you want. Uh, I'm not an investment advisor. I'm just trying to, I guess, uh, help people who wants to uh, learn. And to wrap up, that's I, I'm focusing on high growth. Buy intact growth stories as cheap as possible. And so far, completely intact growth story SK. They're actually expanding blue sky. Goliath is just positive surprise after positive surprise snowline i think is gonna grow uh maybe a lot i'll go over this case another time uh, pacific ridge they have a discovery they have a bunch of projects they have a jv with a major i think they're gonna continue to grow eloro basically the company that can't miss with a drill hole yeah i think they're gonna grow so it's like how many problems do i have not many i mean Regardless of what the gold and silver price is, some of these stories, like if they turn into tier 2, tier 1 discoveries or whatever, it's like they're going to be the first to be bought and they're going to be the last to actually be deemed worthless by the market. Uh, that's the th that's my, my core positions uh, are made up of high probable growth cases with a long runway where I can just hold the... Uh, you know preferably something a bit prettier but you know somewhere along the line so uh, early pan american and you just buy every dip and you just hold the, so basically at, i mean at the end of this period every purchase like great bear would have been in a profit but you would obviously have more profits 
the more uh, you bought, uh, the, the heavier correction, the better. And it's like, yeah, you, you shouldn't hate correction. If the, if the store is intact and they have cash or at least good access to capital, it's just, in my opinion, that's, that's when you buy. I mean, this was a gift. I think this is a real gift. Uh, do your own due diligence, make up your own mind. Uh, uh, this is not investing advice. Consider me biased. I own shares of all the companies I think I mentioned and many are banner sponsors. Uh, yeah, hit the like button if you like these videos and uh, you know, stay strong.